participants are continuing to populate, but we should go ahead and get started to give our panelists the um, full length uh, of time to, to respond. Um, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, once again, I'm Dean Mario Barnes and it's my distinct pleasure um, to welcome you to the Law in the Time of COVID-19 class, um, a, a class that has um, facilitated an incredibly rich set of conversations uh, around uh, our, our current um, circumstance of being subjected uh, to a global pandemic. Um, today, I expect um, the conversation will be no less uh, robust, robust and thoughtful. Uh, and today's topic is, uh, is COVID's impact on the operations of courts um, and the legal system. So I turn it over to our course instructors, Scott Schumacher and Professor Zahar Saeed um, uh, to lead our discussion. Great, thank you, Mario. And I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, first is Dan Clark, who is the Chief Deputy for the Criminal Division of the King County Prosecutor's Office. Uh, Dan joined the office in 1996 and has served as a trial attorney in various units. Uh, he served uh, in, and served nearly four years in the appellate unit, arguing cases before the Court of Appeals and the Washington Supreme Court. Dan served as the Assistant Chief of the Criminal Division for 13 years, and he was promoted to Chief in December of last year. Dan lives with his two teenage sons and is currently apparently high in one of their rooms for this Zoom call. So welcome, Dan. Uh, Jeff Feldman is a, prof is a professor at UW Law and teaches civil procedure and writing and trial practice. He's all order. He's been a trial attorney and an appellate attorney for a very long time. Indeed, his first trial predates Donald Trump's first bankruptcy by 15 years. Uh, our next panelist is Liz Porter. She's an associate professor and the Charles I. Stone Professor of Law at the UW School of Law. Her research, which has been published in many top journals, focuses on civil litigation. Professor Porter teaches civil procedure, complex litigation, torts, and federal courts. She received the university's Distinguished Teaching Award and she's received the Law School's Professor of the Year Award five times. I think we're gonna to have to rename the award after her. Uh, and last but not least is Brenda Williams, who is the director of the Tulalip Tribal Court Public Defense Clinic. The UW Law Tribal Clinic partners with the Tulalip and Muckleshoot tribes in a student-centered partnership that, focus, that functions to provide essential legal services to tribal members while also orienting UW law students to the value and necessity of tribal courts and tribal communities. Students of the clinic have worked in these tri uh, tribal courts since 2001 and assisted tribal members in more than 4,000 criminal and dependency cases. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Um, so this course, as Dean Barnes indicated, is about the impact of, of everything in society regarding uh, because of COVID-19. And frankly, I don't think there's anything more dramatic than the, than the impact on the court system, the rights, rules, procedures, uh, which many of which have dated back hundreds of years. So you phrases like getting my day in court, what does that mean now? Um, so I'd like to go around uh, the, the panel and just ask you, uh, start with you, Dan, uh, what changes have occurred at the King County Prosecutor's Office? Um, great question. Well, um, as soon as the uh, COVID hit, we sort of sprang into action in a number of different ways uh, that were significant. We needed to get as few people into that courthouse as possible. Uh, we have a large operation with the criminal justice system, so we needed to continue cases uh, with agreed orders right away. We needed to clear out the calendars, uh, let people not to know to come to court anymore. Uh, we stopped filing out of custody matters. Uh, right away and um, really focused just on priority cases, cases that had to be filed and continue through the system. We ramped down our court operations to as few courts as possible, but we still have operations going for those in custody uh, defendants. So we still have arraignments and we still have bond hearings, um, case setting, uh, omnibus and that sort of thing. We obviously don't have trials right now. Um, but it was important for us to pare down quickly uh, to inform the public that they were not to come to court um, and to get our staff and the staff of our partners uh, home and working from home, which is uh, an enormous operation when we're talking about a criminal division of 177 attorneys and 160 staff. Uh, and that's just from the prosecutor's office. So a lot of things had to happen uh, very quickly. Um, 
Uh, we also worked with the jail and I'll speak about that a little bit later in ramping down the jail population uh, and coming up with alternatives uh, for those inmates. Um, but we are working uh, still really hard behind the scenes. Um, you know, we've had, apparently nobody got the message to uh, the community to stop committing crimes. So we've had, uh, unfortunately, about 24 homicides since March 1st. Um, we've been filing priority cases to the tune of 435 priority cases since that time. Um, we've, we've been working on cases behind the scenes that are lower priority that we can get caught up and start filing when we do ramp back up the system. Um, but, uh, and unfortunately certain crimes have gone up during this period of time as we predicted. Domestic violence is a perfect example of a crime that has unfortunately increased in this period of time. So we really need to come up with creative solutions on working with our victims and survivors out there. Um, so there's a lot going on behind the scenes uh, post COVID-19 and we're continuing to develop those strategies. Great. Thank you. Uh, Brenda, could you talk about changes that have occurred at the tribal courts and, and what you've been doing uh, in that regard? Sure, I'm happy to. So in Washington state, we have 29 tribes. Uh, the UW Tribal Clinic appears in just two of those, Muckleshoot and Tulalip. A lot of the other tribes also operate uh, courtrooms and I, from the best that I can tell, everybody is functioning remotely at this time. For Tulalip, uh, we've been appearing by video hearing since April 6th. We did telephone hearings before that. About March 13th, in my particular caseload, we had 18 defendants in custody. We immediately began setting motions for their release, asking for alternatives such as anything less restrictive, electronic home monitoring, uh, release with an ankle bracelet is what that means, and um, asking for PR where, where available. We managed to take our caseload of in custodies from 17 down to one. The defendant that remains in custody is serving an actual sentence. So um, not a lot we can do in that particular circumstances so long as the health situation at the facility where that person is detained doesn't have COVID-19. That's the Snohomish County Jail. Um, when this began, the Snohomish County Jail had um, about 180, and excuse me, 850 inmates. We're down to about 330 inmates at this particular type, uh, time. And um, for the other courts that are operating, the tribal courts, some of the smaller courts, I was in touch with the Macaw, the public defender out of Macaw yesterday. Um, and I know at Muckleshoot that there are video and telephone hearings happening. So everything is happening remotely and uh, the public defenders in those environments that I've talked with and the prosecutors that I've talked with are doing an immense amount of work, uh, even though it's all happening remotely. Great, thank you. Um, Liz, you, you, are, you watch the courts and to ask what's happening in the courts would be an impossible question to answer in three minutes. So if you could just focus on what's happening in the Western the United States District Court for the Western District of Washington. Uh, can you hear me? Can't yes. tell Scott. Um, thank you, Scott. I guess uh, I, I want to divide my answer into sort of two parts because I see this as actually a two-part question. Um, uh, first is what have the courts been doing since the pandemic hit, which is sort of the acute, uh, what I call triage stage of the crisis and um, the, the main reaction for civil cases, both in the federal level and the state level in Washington, the primary, not the only, but the primary reaction has just been to stop things and postpone them where possible. Um, that's not been entirely true. So emergency hearings have been going on and to some extent, some other civil proceedings have been going on that were already in process, primarily through telephonic hearing up until this time. And in order to ensure open access to courts, people who would like to listen in on those hearings may do so through an open access telephone number. But the general default response was just to stop anything that could be stopped. So I would say we're just exiting that triage phase now. So last week, the Washington Supreme Court issued an order um, recommending that courts now begin to sort of re sort of start up again with their non-emergency proceedings. Um, at the federal level, um, last week, the federal judiciary requested over $36 million of supplementary funding for the purpose of implementing the changes that would be needed for COVID as a chronic rather than an acute condition. So 
Um, in addition to technological upgrades, they were also requesting money for architectural modifications to courthouses to make it possible for social distancing to happen in the very many different phases of the civil and criminal process. Um, so I guess what I would say is that during the acute phase, a lot happened behind the scenes of postponement. And um, I think we're poised to now see quite rapid change that we haven't necessarily seen up until this point, um, as we've just been sort of marshalling our resources and figuring out what to do. So I feel like we're now moving into what I think of as not the triage stage, but the treatment stage. And we're gonna see a lot of change, particularly relating to virtual hearings at all stages of civil proceedings going forward. Thank you. And Jeff, uh, just to round out the appellate courts, um, including the uh, state and federal, if you if you have comments on those. Sure. The, the appellate courts have had an easier time, not surprisingly, because they have an easier mission. Half, most of the appellate process occurs in writing, and even the part that occurs orally doesn't have the burden of having to deal with witnesses, civilians, non-lawyers, uh, jurors, and the like. Um, for both the state and the federal appellate courts, there's been no change on briefing. The briefing schedules have remained in place and cases have been filed and briefed in the normal way. The big changes, of course, have come in the, in the areas of oral argument. Uh, the Washington Supreme Court quickly moved on to a Zoom platform and their arguments these days look a lot like our classrooms with uh, justices lined up like students waiting for their turn to ask questions, uh, usually moderated by the Chief Justice. Uh, it's been a little bumpy in places, as you might expect, with justices having to get used to not interrupting in the normal fashion that oral arguments sometimes are carried out, but it's, uh, it's been fine, I think. The Court of Appeals took a different path. Uh, Division I decided not to go, uh, go forward with a video approach, and in April only took up what they, determined, what they called NOAs, NOAs, which are no, no oral argument cases. They're smaller cases. And uh, they did that in April. The Court of Appeals Division I did it in May. They did it in June. They're going to do it in June. Um, they're running out of NOAA cases, uh, smaller cases. They've taken some cases from Division II and they're running out of those as well. So they are, the court has apparently resigned that in July they're going to have to do something different. Um, it's likely they'll do what the Supreme Court has done, which is to go on a Zoom platform, although they have also considered the option of perhaps uh, just having regular oral arguments in person, but limiting the presence to only the lawyers who are arguing. Um, that seems less likely to me. The Ninth Circuit has stayed relatively on schedule. The Ninth Circuit always has had a, had a uh, willingness to dispense with oral argument in some cases, and they have done that uh, in, in the last month or two as well. But uh, most of the cases, including the case that was argued yesterday by two UW students uh, uh, as part of the appellate clinic, uh, have been argued on the date that they were originally set for, again, using Zoom uh, as the platform. Uh, the one change in the Ninth Circuit that we have seen is that the circuit has not had any en banc panels since the pandemic consequences hit. Uh, the March calendar was moved to June. The June calendar is now being moved to September, and there's no plans at all for the circuit court to handle en banc arguments remotely. So currently, we have a non-functioning en banc component of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and then as to the US Supreme Court, uh, that court took a bold leap this week. Unfortunately, it was a leap into the 19th century uh, with telephone arguments. But since, this, since that is Professor Porter's uh, first place of employment, I'm gonna to defer to her to explain to you what the Supreme Court did this week. Can I jump in for one second and say, um, I'm gonna ask in, uh, towards the Q&A if Kim Ambrose will tell us about what the Race and Justice Clinic did um, maybe towards the end. I'm just flagging, I might call on you, Kim, because I see you're there and uh, Professor Feldman just mentioned it and it's a fantastic win. So uh, just a heads up. Okay, sorry, the, sorry for so, the interruption. Yeah, so Liz and uh, I guess it's the flush heard around the world uh, was, was yesterday. So if you, if you wanna give us briefly about what's happening in the Supreme, US Supreme Court. So the United States Supreme Court has uh, long resisted, as most of you probably know, has long resisted efforts to have um, cameras in the courtroom. And uh, even in this latest situation, uh, it has not been an exception. So they have just begun to hold our, our arguments by telephone. 
And I think um, there are two things of note about this. One, um, even, even though telephone is not um, the same as video, there have been some advantages to it already. Justice Ginsburg was in the hospital and was able to participate in oral argument by telephone um, from her hospital room, which is uh, pretty remarkable. And to be honest, I don't know um, if previously um, had a justice been hospitalized they would have allowed one person to participate. They would have even, I don't know if the court would even have considered having somebody, one of the justices only participate by video, um, I mean, excuse me, by telephone. Um, but it has necessitated at least temporarily, at least a, a, a quite a seismic shift in the way the court does its arguments um, in the sense that now the justices are requested to ask questions sort of one at a time by order of seniority. It's changing the feeling of the arguments. Um, Justice Thomas has quite a reputation for not asking arguments, um, questions at oral arguments, but um, it seems that in this new, new uh, under this new process, he may ask questions more routinely, although there have not been enough arguments yet um, to tell. Uh, I still think um, Professor Feldman is correct and that we should be um, a truly open and transparent court and that there's um, not such um, good reasons while the rest of us are living in the Zoom world to um, keep the court um, in a somewhat cloistered way where access to the public is truly limited. But there it is. Now we can hear live telephonic oral arguments, which is, um, however minimal technologically, still in advance for the court. Zara, over to you. Great, thanks. Um, thank you so much to our panelists for laying out the kind of landscape of various different courts and offices. Um, that are charged with uh, carrying out the aspects of our legal system at the moment. I'm going to turn in just a minute uh, to Brenda to hear about what our students are doing uh, in their work before the tribal court, uh, but this seems like a good moment uh, to ask Kim to weigh in uh, as our panelist, uh, actually our moderator last week. She knows exactly what a tight ship we run time-wise, so I know she'll be brief, but we'd love to hear uh, uh, your announcement about the Race and Justice Clinic. Um, and Thank you for just, I've just put Hey, what's that spot. about? I just barely snuck on here. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I teach the Race and Justice Clinic, and one of our clients is the Northwest Community Bail Fund, and you may be familiar with community bail funds. Um, they take community dollars that are donated, and they use that to post bail for people who are too poor for uh, to pay their bail. Um, they act as a revolving fund, so as a result of that, during this COVID crisis, um, meaning that they post bail with their cash, and then when the defendants come back, the money gets put back into the fund and they use that to post bail for another uh, client. And right now, because as uh, Dan mentioned, there's not any hearings going on, particularly out of custody hearings. And so uh, defendants aren't able to reappear. And so that money isn't coming back. And so um, the fund is really dwindling at a time when we think it's more critical than ever to get people released from jail. Um, so my students are representing the, um, the, uh, the fund in going after some of the money that has previously been forfeited. It's kind of a complicated, uh, uh, it's a little bit of a complicated process, but they figured out how to file a motion to exonerate those funds and get them back into um, the bail fund um, after the cases have been completed and those people have reappeared. And so they've been filing motions, um, a dozen of them in the past few weeks, and they've brought back about $18,000 to the fund that's now going to be turned around and be used to um, start bailing out some more folks. So it's pretty exciting how hard they're working. I'm just so proud of them um, for the work that they're doing in addition to so many other things that are going right now, going on right now for our students. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, sorry, not sorry. Uh, Brenda, over to you. Sure. So um, in the Tribal Court Public Defense Clinic, we have about 14 students uh, this year. It runs from uh, September through June. Students are actively in court from January through June. Um, we started out with the in-person court experience, students being sworn in and actually being able to meet with their clients and appear before the court. And before we got to the second quarter, we were jumping into video hearings and trying to lay the groundwork for how to practice what you learned in trial advocacy in the online Zoom environment. So to date, uh, students have appeared in more than 50 Zoom hearings. They've been all kinds of hearings with uh, clients calling in by phone, some by video. We had a hearing this week with a 
a video from a grandmother who wanted to appear to make an argument on behalf of their client, I mean, their, their grandchild to be released from custody. And she was calling in from her kitchen. You could see her in her kitchen apron. It was a very personal experience. And it really did, I think, change the nature of the discussion about whether or not this person should remain in custody or not. We encourage the students to just keep the same rules that we use in advocacy. This is a new environment and a great opportunity for them to practice those skills. So we start out, you have to know your courtroom. The technology can be a challenge. So the courtroom here is Zoom. We have to know how it works. Use our mute, unmute button appropriately. Speak clearly. Um, take the time to practice and think about making eye contact with your judge when you are making these arguments, which means actually appearing by video, even though a telephone option is available. I require our students to get dressed for court. They put on a suit and tie. Um, every single one of them is appearing. And that way you're visually making contact with the judge because that's the art of litigation, right? We are trying to persuade the fact finder to make a decision for our clients in our client's favor. Um, we focus on making sure the same thing, students know the rules, know what issues are going to come up in the hearing. We've ended up on a lot of procedural arguments rather than substantive because it's about speedy trial, it's about tolling, it's about when we will actually get constitutional rights effectuated, right? Um, and that turns on what is going to happen in the future. So uh, students have done an excellent job with that. Uh, maintaining professionalism, it's a great opportunity for them to know that you get up, you get dressed, and you appear for court. Um, and that takes us to the final most important lesson for us this quarter, which has been you've got to prepare your client to appear by video from their car or from their home. And that means they need to treat this like it's court because it is court. Um, and so in the tribal court, it's been a wonderful thing, but a lot of people know each other. So they jump on the phone line and you've got cousins and aunties and, oh, well, how, how are you doing? And what were you doing last night? And this is an open line. Um, it's very humanizing. And so I'm, I'm tolerant of that and I understand, but it's also as a litigator nerve wracking because you don't know uh, the judge might be listening um, or you don't know what might be said that could have an impact. So we are encouraging our students now to practice making contact with their client and preparing them for the online experience. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, turning to Jeff Feldman, um, we want to hear how the technology is working out and what sorts of things lawyers should be keeping in mind. But I understand that you had an a, a, uh, oral argument yesterday before the Ninth Circuit that uh, we'd love to hear you. So I, I don't just put Kim on the spot. Um, it's <laughs> equal opportunity. The technology is, is okay. I mean, I, it, it gets the job done. And I would say that it works about as well in an appellate setting or argument setting as it does in a classroom setting, which is to say it allows you to deliver the information. I wouldn't say it, it does it necessarily as effectively. Um, there are some things that I think lawyers have to be on the lookout for. Uh, the normal, there's a normal rhythm to an oral argument that uh, when you stand there arguing, you're also aware that justices or judges are going to want to ask questions. And if you're smart, you are alert to that. And you may even watch faces and be prepared for questions even before they're posed to you. Something that's much harder to do uh, when we're on when we're on Zoom doing it by video. So I think there's a uh, I think we're going to have to learn some new new skills. And I don't think I have mastered them yet since this is all pretty new. But I'm sure it involves some things like talking a little more slowly than you might be inclined to talk in a courtroom. Um, I think it probably involves being very watchful for questions. Uh, because the pr process of interrupting you is a little more cumbersome in a setting where on Zoom, for example, only one person can be heard at a time. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a sort of an axiom uh, that I think we all understand, which is you don't tend to ask questions of the bench. If you're, at the, if you're, if you're arguing your case, you argue your case and you wait for judges to ask you a question. But it has occurred to me that in this platform, there may be an, a reason and an opportunity to to engage your argument and pause at appropriate places and ask the panel uh, or say something like, before I move on to addressing my second point, I feel I should pause and inquire if the panel has any questions. And I don't know if that's what we'll wind up doing, but it does feel to me right now that the connection between lawyer and appellate panel 
um, has been broken a little bit by virtue of the technology. And I think we will need to figure out what it is that we can do as lawyers that will try and mix, smooth that out some. Some of it may just be habituating to the technology. It's generally working okay, though. I mean, given what the options are, cases are being heard, uh, and it's getting the job done, which is the main thing. Thanks. And do you want to share about your um, experience yesterday, you and Liz? Yeah, I mean, the students did great. Uh, great as a, as a, I mean, I, I will, I'll defer to Professor Porter on this as well, but I mean, great is a, is a is not strong enough word to express uh, my pride in how well our two students did. They were completely well prepared. Uh, they dominated the argument. They were on top of the case from start to finish. They were smart. They were articulate. They were responsive. They looked great. They sounded great. Uh, I can't imagine that the argument could have gone any better not only by them, but by anybody. Uh, they just hit a home run. You sound uh, unbiased. I'm very unbiased, but if I were, if I were several decades late, younger, I would say they crushed it. That's what I would say. Um, our questions uh, are, I'm gonna just shuffle the order of the last two uh, questions in this unit, because it seems to lead naturally over to Liz. Um, what sorts of creative lawyering strategies are you seeing, whether it's in teaching and students or out there? And um, what are the big picture issues we can be thinking about with respect to access to justice or um, other ways in which the legal system might actually have some opportunities here, given the, the, the remote way we're being forced to work? Actually, I think there's a massive amount of creativity um, that's been the result of this incredibly painful time by lawyers and by courts, right? It's like everybody is being forced to think about this and learn and develop new strategies. And, um, you know, in the federal civil world, if you change the place where there's a comma in a federal rule, there's like a ripple effect of irritability, um, right? Like we will really debate Oxford commas. It's not, it's, it can be a very slow to innovate um, part of the profession. And here, um, so you can see, I'll just give you some examples of creative things that courts have been doing in this acute phase, um, right? Um, so for example, some districts, including the District of Oregon, and I believe the Western District of Washington, are allowing now pro se litigants to file their cases by email. This seems like a small thing, but um, you know, every friction that's a barrier to pro se litigants filing a case is significant. So it's a fairly substantial, maybe easy innovation um, but significant. Um, we also have um, evidence that some courts in cases where petitions are filed for compassionate release of prisoners are um, weaving exhaustion requirements for those claims in light of the dangers posed by COVID to prisoners. Um, and that's an interesting thing because the exhaustion requirement is, um, as far as I understand, statutory. So, right? it's, compl it's complicated. So you have some kind of just uh, emergency compassion based innovations. Um, and then you actually have uh, some innovations that maybe harken back to the Supreme Court's 19th century innovation that are still helping. So I saw an example of an, um, a wage and hour litigation um, for a bunch of workers where typically in order to notify workers of that action, you would post information about it at their place of employment. But since the place of employment is closed, you can't notify them that way. And so the, the court allowed um, the plaintiff's attorneys to publicize this wage and hour action on Spanish language speaking radio, right? So basically this could have been done before, um, but it's an innovation that's forced by circumstance. It's not necessarily the use of new technology. Um, I guess what I would wanna say is going forward, what ways, I think it's important to try to preserve the parts of this time that allow people who live far from courthouses, who may be undocumented and not want to come to the court, who may have physical illness or disability that hinders their coming to courts to have this access. Everybody being forced to use telephone or Zoom might be a problem, but having access to courthouse that can be enhanced by this is a quite powerful tool for increasing access to courts um, for all types of litigants, in including civil litigants. Um, I guess maybe um, Dan will talk about this further, but I just want to note also that in King County in particular, there have been efforts to uh, make this online system for filing motions for a protective order, right? Sort of a criminal civil um, sort of hybrid, but you can see even at the most local level efforts to try to respond to the needs of the community under these situations. And I think even if we could just preserve some of that attitude going forward, that itself 
could lead to further beneficial change. Great, thank you, Liz. And and um, so, Dan, just to follow up on that, since Liz teed it up so nicely, um, so what is the prosecutor's office doing to both reduce jail population and ensure access to justice for victims? Yeah, thanks. Uh, similar to what Liz was saying, this is sort of our moonshot moment. And I think that a lot of times we're um, asked to be very creative in a very short period of time and be very nimble with a with a large criminal justice system. So one of the things that we had been working on for a long time uh, up until now was developing sort of a turbo tax way of filling out forms for online protection orders so that um, survivors and victims of domestic violence um, didn't have to come into court and meet with our advocates and then go into the court system to make their request for protection order. That this could be done in the uh, comfort of their home, maybe in a safe space that they could do that online and have online access to victim advocates um, that are now uh, working with them, um, you know, by phone or what have you. Um, we've been exploring lots of different options to make sure that we are there for our victims uh, and able to file these protection orders. Also, there's a, emergency protection orders uh, related to firearm possession. And as I've mentioned, we know that unfortunately domestic violence has gone up. And so we've actually redeployed some of our other resources to assist with those advocates online so that they can be there for the victims. Um, to the first part of your question, uh, in terms of the PAO's role in reducing jail population, you know, it was a fascinating project that basically the jail reached out to us in the defense and said, we've got 1,900 people in the, in the King County jails right now. We need to drop that to about 1,300 to uh, engage in um, proper social distancing. Go. And uh, it is not typically uh, maybe the job of a prosecutor. You might not think of it as the job of a prosecutor to empty out the jails, but it very much is along the lines of, of our mission, which is to do justice and do the right thing. And, and so we collaboratively worked with the head of Department of Public Defense and said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a data-driven approach. We're gonna run the numbers of everybody who's in jail. We're gonna run all the stats, figure out who's in there for uh, what types of crimes, what's their criminal history, what's their likelihood of returning, and we will, um, rather than just set um, 1,900 bond hearings, that's not going to help anybody. Let's work very quickly and identify who we can agree for less restrictive alternatives. Who can we put on home detention? Who can we put um, on a temporary release? Uh, who can we put on pretrial diversion programs? And we immediately started doing that work, a deep dive. We dispersed it amongst our unit chairs and um, I'm really proud of the efforts that we were able to work with public defense so that we didn't have to have all these bond hearings. We actually came up with agreed orders on nearly every single one of those cases. And we monitor that number every single day. So it's been, um, it's been really helpful. It's been really collaborative and um, you know eye-opening and I hope that that continues. Yeah, and just a, a quick follow-up. Could you describe the difference between jail, which is uh, what you were just discussing, and then the, the Department of Corrections in the prison and just the different populations in that? Because I think our, our students in the audience would like to understand the difference. Sure, absolutely. So um, the jail is, is primarily comprised of folks who are awaiting their trial. Uh, it is a, a temporary location. It's, it's connected to the courthouse. Um, there is a lot of turnover by people who get booked that night by police. They're there awaiting trial or they're serving very short sentences under a year. Prison is when somebody is sentenced to something over a year. They are no longer pre-trial. They're post-trial. They're post-sentencing and they're serving extended sentences. And as you know, um, the governor has uh, issued an order trying to release some of those inmates as well. And we've been working with the Department of Corrections uh, a little bit on uh, notifying our victims for those cases uh, for people who are getting released as well. Okay, so um, I'm, I, we have a couple more uh, questions that we have prepared and then I see that there uh, is a Q&A that uh, the panelists can see and we also have questions from students. So we'll sort of try to work uh, those in. Uh, one of the questions that emerge as the panelists um, organized uh, beforehand was, what sorts of changes do we imagine will outlast this pandemic? I mean, what of these things that we're seeing are temporary changes? And it builds a little bit off where uh, Liz was uh, talking about a few moments ago um, and ways that there are some improvements brought about by these technologies. Um, so first to you, Jeff, 
do you think that um, uh, courts of appeal might stop traveling as much for uh, oral arguments? Do we expect that uh, more uh, proceedings of various kinds will uh, be held remotely? Um, let's start with you. Yeah, I, th I think on the state side, it's unlikely. Uh, I think as soon as the state appellate courts are able to hold in-person arguments, they'll go back to that because I'm, I have every confidence that they regard that as a better process. And, uh, you know, the people, lawyers, generally speaking, are, are reasonably close to courthouses. The Ninth Circuit's in a different situation because the panelists uh, travel long distances. The Ninth Circuit already had been doing a little bit of, of uh, remote business, uh, not whole panels, but uh, there are uh, judges in the Ninth Circuit who have travel restrictions or are mobility impaired, and they have uh, participated both in the arguments and in court conferences remotely. So this is not a brand new feature for the circuit. Um, and whether, I mean, I, it's not a superior process. I don't think anyone's going to say this works better on video than it does in person. But there obviously are cost savings, and uh, and for so long as there's a health risk, I don't doubt that that's where we'll be. Uh, projecting ahead as to when, when there is no no longer health risk, whether we'll still be doing this, I have some doubts about this. I, I doubt that the circuit court would regard the economic savings alone as being um, a, a worthwhile trade for what they think they get out of an in-person argument. So I, I think we'll drift back toward that in due course, but. Uh, when will that be? I don't know. And these questions are the kinds of things that um, we can imagine just as in the wake of the um, ADA, the American Disabilities with Act changed how we think about physical spaces that we share. And maybe we'll see things go in one direction or another. This certainly implicates the jury, which we'll come to. Um, but in addition to those potentially architectural or uh, interior sorts of changes, we've got all these e-tools that uh, are changing the way practice. We've heard from three or four of you already just about how those tools are changing the work of lawyers uh, and uh, clients uh, throughout the system. Liz, let me turn to you. Do you think that telephonic hearings, video hearings, other sorts of mechanisms, e-filings are something that, that are likely to be here post-pandemic? Um, I think the answer to that will depend a little bit on um, the individual courts or court systems and also to some extent on how long the crisis lasts. So I, many of you um, who are watching can probably see this in yourselves, even within the last few weeks, we have all become vastly more sophisticated in our ability to comfortably use these technologies, not just in terms of um, reading the chat stream while we're also speaking or raising our hands using the little blue Zoom hand, but also just being able to look at people's faces and um, more like real life perceive something that's going on. And then it, 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 when that becomes stronger, then we have these other advantages that Brenda's speaking about, which is to say we could actually get a little bit more context, um, have more sort of ability to see people fully outside of just courtroom environments. Um, but I think it will vary. Um, I guess my question, if you think about civil litigation um, as a giant category is, could you even make um, uh, an assessment about everything? Because I guess I, part, part of the way I can imagine it is as a client. So do I wanna pay Zara to have you fly to New York to do my hearing? Um, and the question might be how much is on the line for the hearing? And over time, you know, 12 months from now, how much of a difference will it make? Or are the judges great at Zoom and you're great at Zoom and we've actually compensated some, and then I'm looking at just, you know, um, a flight to New York, a bunch of hotel rooms, in addition to all of these billable hours and I'm rethinking it. So I feel like the answer will be different for small claims, for everyday claims, um, and for bigger commercial litigation. Zara, can I offer a comment that's the flip side of what Liz just said? So there is a lot of symbolism in the law. You know, we have judges and justices wear black robes because it, it conveys a sense of neutrality and impartiality. We make them sit up higher than everybody else in the courtroom because it reflects their position of authority. We put witnesses in a box. We have a bar or a wall, half a wall that separates the spectators from the well of the courtroom. These are not accidental features. These are all things that evolved over time that, that stand for symbols that are, that are essential, not essential, but they are certainly integral parts of our our way of doing business with the courts. And one of the things that this, this, this platform, the Zoom platform does, 
it's the ultimate democracy. I mean, everybody shows up in a small little square looking exactly the same as everybody else. And uh, you can't, I mean, look at the screen. Can you tell on the screen who the dean is? No, we can't tell you that. You know, I mean, it's, it's the same thing is true in these court proceedings, although judges are wearing robes, so we have that much going for us. But uh, the point I'm making here is that uh, when we put this online, we're stripping out of the process a lot of what has been the traditional symbols that are part of the adjudicatory world. And I think we all, somebody ought to be giving some thought to that. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think it's a thing though. I think it's a dimension that will represent a change. Go ahead, Liz. Um, I totally agree with Jeff, which is to say that even, even the physical concept of a courthouse is so essential to what we think of as justice. Um, but I'm just noting um, in the spirit of massive innovation as this goes on, that it's, I, you, one could envision um, a variation on Zoom that was used by courts that preserved visually some of that hierarchy. We're not there yet because we're just throwing this up against a wall on Zoom. But you could imagine if we if we are more virtual, um, you know, screen backgrounds and placement of screens in a way that would, to some extent, not the same, but replicate that same sense of um, of sanctity of the courtroom, maybe. And one thing to think about, and I'll hand it over to Scott, as I know he's got two pretty important questions left as well. Um, one thing to think about is what values are driving any of that kind of design. I mean, we can design a system that's more inclusive and more usable by teenagers and usable by people without a legal degree, or we can design a system that, you know, is designed for older people or people with black robes, right? Uh, and so it's kind of worth thinking about what sorts of uh, design values we put into the process. Um, Scott, over to you. Uh, uh, Brenda and Dan both talked about the, the work that they'd done in, in, in delaying trials, doing triage work, um, getting people out of jail, but eventually somebody's going to have to be tried, uh, and there's a Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial. Uh, and so I'll go to you first, Brenda, to just ask what what the tribal court has done regarding the speedy trial, right? So there's a, there's a constitutional right to a speedy trial. Um, and the Sixth Amendment right to, to, to a jury trial. So what has the Tulalip tribe done in that regard? Right, thanks, Scott. So um, I want to start out by just uh, reminding folks that tribal courts function as the trial courts for sovereign nations. Um, and as sovereign nations, they are exercising their inherent sovereignty. They're not subject to the U.S. Constitution, um, but are instead subject to each of their own individual tribal constitutions and the Indian Civil Rights Act, setting sort of a floor um, of guarantees. And so some tribal courts have already amended their codes. It's a smaller community. Their councils meet regularly and they can make changes to law fairly quickly. I've seen this if I uh, win a motion at times, I've seen uh, the law changes quicker than maybe it would happen if we're waiting for the legislative session that's coming you know, at the start of next year, for example. Um, at Tulalip, uh, the uh, uh, tribal council has already amended their uh, their tribal code to authorize the judge to the chief judge, uh, Chief Michelle uh, Demmer, to uh, uh, make the changes that she deems necessary. So she's already issued rulings. And much like Professor Porter indicated, um, the, it depends on the kind of case. And the way that Judge Demmer has proceeded is by differentiating the in custody versus the out of custody cases. So obviously if someone is in custody, that will be the matter that we look at for considering when jury trials reopen and what is that going to look like. But it also allows the prosecuting attorney's office and the judge and the defense to focus on crimes that need to be prosecuted now, maybe a crime of violence. And at, uh, employing alternative remedies for things that involve property crimes or drug related crimes so that the majority of the defendants who we've had released from custody are defendants who were being detained for drug offenses. And so this allows um, the court to prioritize. So the triage is still going to continue even when we are into a, a place where we start to resume trials. And then we have to look at what is the structure of it going to be. And I like to think about what we do when we set up rules for uh, when we sequester a jury, for example. We have sequestered juries in the past for what I would say are less 
uh, meaningful reasons, then like the idea of public health should be superior. Like that is actually a superior reason to consider um, using sequestering in the cases that absolutely must be tried. Um, so that's kind of one framework to begin the conversation. Great, thank you. Uh, Dan, uh, what's King County been doing? And particularly, what do you think the jury trial of the future, assuming we're still in the health crisis that we're in, what, what do you think the jury trial of the future will look like, I guess, in the near future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, two things. Uh, the Superior Court has just set up uh, a meeting of a work group with uh, both um, civil attorneys and criminal attorneys to try and start to hash that out. We know that jury trials is the last piece of the puzzle that's going to be put in place. Um, and I think it's important for people to recognize that you know, many people think the jury trial is the end all be all of our of our system, but really about 85% of our cases resolved by some sort of plea well short of a jury trial. So there's a lot of business that can take place before we get to the jury trial, but some cases will end up a jury trial. I think what we're likely going to see is a lot of robust um, motion practice uh, related to dispositive motions that can be done before we need to bring jurors into the courthouse to really winnow down that list of cases that are set for trial to the ones that actually will be heard. There's a lot of negotiations that take place once those motions are heard, uh, whether they're dispositive or not. Um, and then we really need to rethink sort of all the issues surrounding uh, what a jury trial is going to look like. How do we summon the jurors to come in? Where do we uh, collect them? Um, you know, how are they, how are we going to handle voir dire in a courtroom? Um, you know, where are they going to sit? Where are they going to deliberate? How are we going to, if we're going to do this by video, how do we mark and admit evidence and exhibits? Um, there's just a hundred different questions of practical issues that we need to outline before we get there. I think the court's going to do a good job, hopefully, with us in identifying which cases are a priority to go out. Um, how we do that's going to be very interesting. Um, people who are in jail right now are continuing to get credit for the time that they're serving in jail that will be applied to whatever sentence that they um, need to serve. For those defendants that are getting close to that credit for time served, uh, we're looking at negotiations to get them out. If we can get them out, then there's less of the um, concern about the time to trial issue. And our Supreme Court addressed the time to trial issue in a recent order that found good cause and unavoidable circumstances. So it legally it extended the time to trial um, for the uh, under the state Supreme Court rules, uh, which is different than the constitutional standard. Do any of the panelists have, we have just a couple of minutes left. Do, do any of the panelists have questions for each other or sh short observations? Um, and or would the Dean like to weigh in on any of these issues since um, they, they affect in some ways what we're trying to teach our students? Just opening it up to the panelists and Dean. On the jury trial matter, I would just add that I um, agree that eventually we will have to figure out the mechanics of how the trial happens. But a lot of the trial can happen remotely. Um, and I'm thinking about things like jury instructions and um, all of the pretrial, I mean, the, the, the matters that have to be handled administratively. Typically, we bring the jury in, we make them wait, we do all these different things that need to be addressed legally. Um, but I think we can introduce a serious efficiency to the jury trial process if we focus on having them present for only what's absolutely necessary. Thanks. Yeah, and I guess I would say, um, I think there are lessons um, and insights for access to justice here. Um, and the, the truth of, um, uh, Dean Schumacher started with the concept of what does it mean to have your day in court? Um, but we don't often ask the companion question of what we do for people for whom getting to court um, is such a, a trial or such a um, challenge um, because of things like obligations to care for others and um, the cost. And um, I think that what this COVID-19 experience has taught us is that there, um, that justice can be administered and dispensed um, effectively um, through means that don't actually require physical presence in the courtroom. And I want to just pick up on something that Brenda says, and that perhaps the ways in which that will happen will be humanizing. Um, maybe it's good for us to see the, the grandmother in her kitchen being able to participate in the same ways that others that have more status and access and um, privilege um, do. And so I am hopeful that um, we'll use this as a kind of laboratory or experiment to ask 
um, what have we learned about our system that we should um, deploy in being more thoughtful and more inclusive um, when we come out of the crisis and not simply have this be a one-off um, of something courts did um, to accommodate um, an inability of people to appear in the short term? I don't think we could choose a better ending note than that right there. Thank you so much panelists for this stimulating conversation and for teaching us all. And um, yeah, our, our sort of, we need a better clapping mechanism on Zoom. Somebody get on that. Um, and um, thank you very much. Next week, we'll be joined by uh, Ryan Kahlo uh, and two speakers um, as well on uh, surveillance and technology's role uh, in the pandemic and, and crisis management. Um, the uh, panelists, if you'd like to join us for our uh, 1.30 to 2 p.m. session with students, we'll see you over there. Uh, and everyone who tuned in today, thanks so much for joining us.